Good morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever those of you watching may be. Uh, I'm John Holdren, uh, Professor of Environmental Science and Policy at Harvard University and co-director of the Arctic Initiative at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. I have the privilege of serving as the moderator of this breakout session on thawing Arctic permafrost at this, the first virtual annual meeting of the National Academy of Sciences. Temperatures across the Arctic are increasing two to four times faster than the global average. The reasons for this rapid Arctic climate change are very well understood scientifically, and we have high confidence that they will persist, which means that the Arctic will continue to be the leading edge of global climate change. More about that in a moment, but first a few geopolitical facts about the region. Uh, definitions of what constitutes the Arctic differ around the edges, but the simplest definition is that the Arctic is the area north of the Arctic Circle. That adds up to about 20 million square kilometers, or about 8 million square miles, of which 70% is ocean, variously ice-covered and open. Eight nations have land or territorial waters in the Arctic, the United States because of Alaska, Canada, Iceland, Denmark because of Greenland, Norway, Sweden, Finland, and Russia. The largest share of Arctic land is in Russia. The population north of the Arctic Circle totals only 4 million, about half in Russia. Indigenous people make up 10% of that total. But the Arctic gets political attention far out of proportion to its population for a number of reasons. Its strategic importance in terms of defense, its economic importance in terms of oil and gas, other mineral resources, fisheries, and potentially navigation for commerce, its magnificent wildlife and sweeping landscapes, its indigenous cultures, and especially now, how climate change is posing increased opportunities in some of these domains and increased challenges in most of them. The dramatic consequences of the rapid warming of the Arctic are already apparent. Those consequences include dramatic reduction in summer coverage of ice on the Arctic Ocean, with somewhat smaller reductions in winter coverage. That represents, by the way, both an opportunity and a set of challenges. Accelerating loss of land ice from glaciers and the Greenland ice sheet, which is accelerating global sea level rise. A huge increase in the incidence and size of wildfires in the Arctic and subarctic including expansion of those fires into the tundra, altered atmospheric and oceanic circulation patterns because the temperature difference between the Arctic and the mid-latitudes is shrinking as the Arctic warms faster. And finally, the particular focus of this panel, the ongoing heating and thawing of the permafrost that underlies most of the land area of the Arctic and subarctic regions. Permafrost thaw is a direct threat to buildings, roads, and pipelines, and it can greatly accelerate erosion along rivers and coastlines with severe consequences for the communities located there, many of them indigenous communities. But an impact with much wider consequences is the release of carbon dioxide and methane by the decomposition of previously frozen organic matter affecting the rate of growth of global warming and all of its impacts everywhere. There's estimated to be something like two and a half times as much carbon in permafrost soils as in the entire global atmosphere. The key question is how fast it will come out. Our panel today will discuss the science of warming and thawing permafrost, the impacts of these phenomena regionally and globally, and a bit about the responses of the global scientific and policy communities. Our speakers. First speaker will be Dr. Sue Natali, who is the director of the Arctic Project at the Woods Hole Research Center in Woods Hole, Massachusetts. The second speaker will be Dr. Katie Walter Anthony, research professor at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, which is often called the U.S. Arctic University. The third speaker was to be Dr. Mike Sfrega, 
director of the Polar Institute at the Woodrow Wilson Center in Washington, D.C., and former vice chancellor of the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Unfortunately, we just learned this morning that Dr. Sfrega's father is very seriously ill in Fairbanks, where Dr. Sfrega also is, and he will be unable to join us. Uh, since I often give talks about the same topic, uh, I will cover uh, that aspect of the panel discussion. That will be followed uh, when the three panelists have each spoken for about 20 minutes. That will be followed uh, by a Q&A among the panelists and then Q&A uh, with the audience. So let me turn now to Dr. Sue Natali. Um, great. Um, thank you, John, um, for organizing this session for the introduction. Um, good day to everyone who's here, and I just want to thank everyone for joining our virtual panel. Um, I'm going to share my screen for a presentation. Okay, and hopefully everyone can see that. Um, so my name is Sue Natale. I'm a scientist and I'm the Arctic Program Director at the Woods Hole Research Center. Um, for my research, I focus, I'm an Arctic ecologist and my research focuses primarily on the ecosystem and carbon cycling consequences of permafrost thaw. Um, there will be an opportunity at the end of our panel for questions, which I believe you can submit by um, the link on the page. Uh, my email address is at the bottom of this first slide, and you're free to email me with any additional questions or if you'd like more information. I'm going to start off this panel with an introduction of permafrost and why it's important both regionally and for global climate, and then we'll continue on with the other panelists who will explore some of these topics in greater depth. I want to first start out with a global perspective on climate trends. Um, I'm sure most of you have seen this figure or some other version of these data. This is the global average temperature difference for each year compared to the mean temperature over the past about 140 years. Um, the left axis here is temperature in Celsius and the right is Fahrenheit. So our current temperature anomaly, or the difference from this long-term average, is close to one degree Celsius or 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, this is important to keep in mind because as you may realize, the 2015 Paris Climate Accord, um, the international community set a goal of keeping global average temperature below two degrees Celsius increase with an ambition of 1.5 degrees Celsius. So we're already very close. The other point I want to make is that this is a global temperature average. Um, in some regions and some time periods are warming much faster than others. In the Arctic, as John said, the Arctic is one of them. This becomes very clear when we take a look at the map temperature anomalies. In this case, this is the average air temperature last March 2019, March 2019, um, compared to the 1950 to 1980 average. The scale here is in Celsius. Um, this month was particularly warm with temperatures 4 to 12 degrees Celsius above the long-term average. Um, that's a quite extreme warming. Um, but this month was not um, a strange outlier. Um, and in fact, the average rate of warming in the Arctic is more than twice as fast as the rest of the planet. And the Arctic already has, has already increased its average temperature by two degrees Celsius warmer than the long-term average. So this global target has already been reached in the Arctic. There are a number of consequences of Arctic warming, which include sea ice loss, melting of Greenland ice sheet, and permafrost thaw, which is the focus of our panel today. So this is a picture of what it looks like when permafrost thaws. This is a forest in Northeast Siberia where I've worked. Um, and just a, sort of an intro to permafrost. Permafrost is ground that remains frozen all year. Um, it's made up of soil, organic material, rock, ice, anything that's frozen in that ground. The organic material is derived from decayed plants and microbes, and it's important because it contains a lot of carbon. Um, you can also see in this picture that the permafrost can contain ice, and you see some very large ice wedges in this picture. This is the area that kind of looks like it's just uh, water, perhaps, or wet soil that's actually ground ice. Um, the ice is important because it provides structure for the ground surface. Uh, 
Um, when the permafrost thaws and this ice melts, the ground can collapse. It can be quite severe, as you can see is happening to this forest where the trees are toppling off the edge of this cliff. Uh, most permafrost is many thousands of years old, and this is important because the carbon that's locked up in permafrost has not been part of our active, um, actively cycling carbon pool. So in this sense, it's very similar to fossil fuels. The other important part of the permafrost system that we'll be mentioning today is the active layer. Um, this is the ground that sits on top of the permafrost, and this ground thaws each summer when the air temperatures get warmer and then refreezes again in the, in the winter, similar to what happens in, in lower latitudes. Um, this is also the area of ground where most of the biological activity takes place. It's where you find plant roots and also where a lot of the microbial decomposition occurs in the active layer. Um, so this is a map showing the distribution of permafrost. Uh, it covers more than 14 million kilometers squared of northern lands. Um, that's more than 1.5 times the size of the United States. So the permafrost regions comprise about a quarter of the northern hemisphere land area. Um, so it's, it's a lot of area that is underlain by permafrost. Um, and you can see this here depicted by the color area on this map. Uh, most of the northern permafrost is in Russia, followed by Canada, um, the United US state of Alaska, Greenland, and Eastern Europe. The projected losses of permafrost by 2100 range from 30 to 70 percent of the surface area of permafrost. Um, this is a very wide range. It's partly driven by uncertainty in the models, but it's really mostly driven by uncertainty in human action. So if we greatly reduce fossil fuel, emiss fossil fuel emissions and control global temperature increase, we can expect to see 30 percent loss of permafrost area. Um, if we continue um, emitting fossil fuels at our current rate, um, about 70% of the per surface permafrost will thaw. Um, I want to point out that permafrost thaw isn't a process of the future, despite the fact that we talk about 2100 a lot, or 2300, or beyond. Um, permafrost is warming and thawing now, and it has been for decades. We know this because there's a network of boreholes, permafrost monitoring boreholes across the Arctic, um, US, Russia, and other parts of the Arctic, um, where deep permafrost temperatures have been measured for many years, in some cases for 40 years. So each one of these lines represents one of those monitoring stations. Most of the lines, uh, most of the sites represented here are in Alaska, and they're measuring very deep temperatures, about 20 meters depth. So these temperature changes aren't representing seasonal dynamics. Um, and there is some variation in the rate of warming across these permafrost boreholes, um, the trend is always in the upward direction. So it's pretty much permafrost temperatures are warming across the board in very cold areas as represented in this map, um, in this figure, and also in warmer areas of permafrost. So I just want to show you a couple of pictures um, and talk about the process of permafrost thaw and what happens. Um, this is a picture of thawing tundra outside Healy, Alaska, and um, this is a place that I've worked for many years. Um, when permafrost thaws, it's common to find areas of ground subsidence or ground collapse as a result of ice melt. So that last picture I showed had some very extreme ice wedges in it, um, but you don't always have to have such extreme ground collapse to have important um, impacts on the ecosystem. So you can see in this picture, these lower lying areas that are saturated, these are areas where the permafrost has thawed. Um, and this is causing some really important ecosystem changes, um, including changes to the plant community and also changes in carbon and nutrient cycling. Um, Katie will talk more in her um, presentation about methane emissions, but I do wanna point out these wet areas that can form following permafrost thaw are um, very conducive to methane production. So this becomes important when we're trying to figure out um, not just how much carbon will be released when permafrost thaws, but what will its form be? Will it be carbon dioxide or methane? Again, um, this is another picture from Siberia. This is an exposure called Devani Yar. Um, these soils contain very large ice wedges. I think it's, it's more clear to see that in this picture. All those shiny areas are very large areas of ice, um, leading to abrupt ground thaw. And um, 
really a complete restructuring of this ecosystem. And while permafrost can refreeze if once after it thaws, if the climate cools, um, situations like this actually cannot be um, changed or cannot go back to what, how they were, um, particularly not on a human relevant time scale. In addition to the impacts on Arctic ecosystems, permafrost thaw and ground collapse is also threatening Arctic communities, um, including homes, um, infrastructure, such as this airstrip that you see here, um, and cultural and subsistence resources. Um, thawing permafrost and other climate change hazards, such as flooding, um, which is not unrelated to permafrost thaw, are particularly of concern for coastal communities um, and also communities such as this one. This is a community located in the Yukon Kuskokwim Delta, Alaska. You see this straight um, pathway of water it used to be a path where people would move around. Um, it was a boardwalk where people would move around in the landscape, but it's, it's no longer accessible. So I want to just point out that the impacts of permafrost thaw are widespread across the region. Um, this is a risk assessment map. So this is showing areas with high geophysical hazard potential and in the darker red. So by geophysical hazard potential, this is some um, measure of the likelihood of the ground to thaw and also for that ground to collapse, um, thereby impacting people and infrastructure. And the point I want to make here is that, you know, permafrost thaw and ground collapse isn't a problem of next century. This is map is through um, showing the hazards through 2050, um, which is not that far away. Um, and this is showing the impacts, even if we have as little uh, as 1.5 degrees Celsius of global temperature increase. Um, so even with this relatively low level of warming, there are a lot of people and infrastructure that will be at risk. Okay, so um, that's all I'm gonna say about the regional effects of warming. I'm gonna talk um, for the rest of my talk about the global effects. So how does permafrost thaw affect global climate? Um, well, the way that affects global climate is through carbon, as um, you probably already know. Um, the Arctic stores a large pool of carbon, both in the active layer and permafrost soils. It's estimated about 1,100 to 1,500 billion tons of carbon. Um, as I noted earlier, this is um, in, primarily in the form of ancient organic matter. You can see these very old plant roots that had been frozen in the permafrost. Um, and once thawed, that organic matter can be decomposed by microbes, then released into the atmosphere as carbon dioxide and methanes. Um, that seems like a very large carbon pool. And to put that in context for you, um, this permafrost carbon contains twice as much carbon as is in the atmosphere. Um, and it contains three times as much carbon as is in the world's forest biomass. So every tree um, there's carbon that's stored in every tree and every forest across the planet. There's three times more carbon uh, currently stored in permafrost. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about the carbon climate feedbacks from permafrost. There's two main carbon climate feedbacks. Um, the first process is amplification of um, thawing. Do um, Amplification of warming as a result of permafrost thaw. When the permafrost thaws, microbes can now access that organic matter and release carbon dioxide and methane. At the same time, um, warming temperatures, increased atmospheric carbon dioxide, and nutrient release from thawing permafrost may stimulate plant growth, um, in which case carbon dioxide would be removed from the atmosphere stored in plant biomass, and this may offset some of the effects of permafrost thaw. And both of these processes are happening at the same time. The question is, um, which one is happening more? So for the past thousands and tens of thousands of years, we say the Arctic has been a carbon sink. So what that means is there's been more carbon taken up from the atmosphere and stored in soils um, because the soils have been so cold and frozen. As the climate warms, if carbon emissions outpace uptake, as is expected, the permafrost region may turn into a new source of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. So the big question that I and many, many other scientists are working to answer is how much permafrost carbon will be released in what form, carbon dioxide or methane, and how soon? Um, the Arctic scientific community is tackling this challenging question in a number of different um, research pathways, including observations from space, um, from satellite observations, 
um, using on the ground uh, monitoring through models and through lab and field experiments. So I'm going to show you an example of one of these field experiments. This is a whole ecosystem warming experiment, um, which means that we warm the air and we also thawed, warm the soils and we thawed the permafrost to address this question. Um, this area where we conducted this experiment, like much of the Arctic, is remote and not in the vicinity of a power grid. So um, we use passive methods for warming the air. Um, as you can see on the left, this is a chamber that acts like a mini greenhouse. Um, and then we warm the soils essentially by insulating them using snow. So snow insulates the ground from the cold winter temperatures, um, resulting in soil temperatures that are warmer and also increased thaw depth. So what we found um, when we conducted this experiment is that there was a very positive and strong effect of warming and permafrost thaw on the plant com community. So the plants leafed out earlier in the spring, they stayed green later in the fall, and overall they had greater biomass than plants in areas that were not warmed. And you can see this early leaf out quite obviously in these two photos that were taken on the same day. The one on the left is from a plant, a betula nana or dwarf birch plant that wasn't warmed, and the one on the right is from a plant that was warmed. Because of the increased photosynthetic activity when the plants were warmed uh, and the air was warmed and the soil was thawed, um, there was two times more carbon dioxide removed from the atmosphere by warmed tundra during the summer. Um, so this seems like good news, right? I mean, we're warming and thawing the permafrost and the plants are responding by removing additional carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, um, except there's a little bit more to this story. Um, similar to processes that are happening across the landscape, the ground in this experimentally thawed area began to co collapse and subside and get wetter. And we had these areas of pooling. Um, these saturated conditions, which are conducive to the production and release of carbon dioxide, a much more potent greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. And indeed, when we consider the increased global warming potential of methane, um, its emissions offset summer uptake of carbon dioxide so that the summertime carbon budget was near neutral. And there's one more important piece to this story, which is the extended cold season in the Arctic. Um, I loosely refer to this time period as the winter, but when I say winter, I'm referring to the time period from about um, October through April. Um, during this time, Arctic plants are more or less dormant um, because it's dark and it's cold, and so they're not taking up carbon dioxide. Um, however, microbes can remain active in these frozen soils. Another important aspect of the Arctic winter is that this is the time period that has been warming the most. Um, so this is a time when plants cannot respond um, because they're um, not active. And we're also getting the highest rates of warming. So these two maps show seasonal temperature anomalies for 2017 and 2018 across the Arctic. The growing season is on the left and the winter cold period is, on the, period is on the right. And you can see these very dark red areas representing higher rates of warming um, during this winter. So as I said, this is important because while plants can and are offsetting carbon emissions from soils, um, the amplifi amplified warming in the winter may tip the balance, so to speak, in the favor of the microbes. Um, indeed, this is what we found in our experiment. The rates of microbial respiration in the winter increased by 60% in the soils that were warmed. Um, as a result, um, the system was not a carbon sink on an annual basis, but it actually was a source of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. So this is a graph showing the annual net ecosystem exchange um, or the net balance of carbon dioxide uptake and losses over the entire year. I'm showing you an example of one year, 2011. Um, positive values or val bars that are going above the zero line represent an annual carbon sink or net uptake and negative values represent a source or net release of carbon. So I wanna point out a couple of things on this graph. First of all, the, the white bars represent ambient plots. So this is the system without any warming. And this system already um, is a source of CO2 to the atmosphere. Um, this is an area that had been a carbon sink for many, many um, thousands of years. Um, when we 
warmed the soil and thawed the ground, shown here in blue, um, the source strength more than doubled. So there was more than twice as much carbon dioxide um, being released into the atmosphere. Um, the yellow bar here represents areas where we only warmed the air, um, and this is showing the influence of plant uptake of carbon. Um, that's not really a realistic warming scenario without um, the accompanying ground warming and thaw. So this is a really interesting result, suggesting that the Arctic has already shifted to a carbon source. But this is just one site. Um, it's located on relatively warm permafrost, and we really can't extrapolate from you know, one point on a map to the entire um, large Panarctic region. So given the importance of winter for the Arctic carbon budgets, um, the fact that warming is amplified in the winter, and there's a lot of relatively um, high knowledge gaps in the winter compared to other seasons. We synthesize winter carbon dioxide emission data from across the Arctic region, and we upscaled our results to derive a pan-Arctic estimate of how much carbon dioxide is being released to the atmosphere during the winter period. Um, this is a figure showing all of the plots. You can see um, we get um, carbon emissions at very, very low temperatures down to minus 20 degrees Celsius. Um, we used a machine learning approach to scale these um, figures across the Pan-Arctic region. And we found that the Arctic region releases 1,662 um, million tons of carbon during the winter. Um, what does this mean on an annual basis? Well, we compared our numbers to a number of process models, um, estimates of how much Arctic um, carbon the Arctic is taking up during the growing season, um, which estimates 687 to 1,647 carbon taken up, um, suggesting that the Pan-Arctic region is already um, a carbon source to the atmosphere. Okay. Um, so what does this mean um, for the future? Um, there's a lot of uncertainty in estimating carbon emissions for the future, um, but a recent synthesis estimated that if we continue on our current warming trajectory, permafrost carbon emissions could equal 150 billion tons cumulative by 2100. Um, and this is on par with our current US rate of emissions. Um, these estimates, keep in mind, are not accounting for some really important processes. One of this is these abrupt thaw events, which Katie will talk more about. Um, and also there's a um, positive feedback between fire and permafrost thaw. So um, fire removes the organic matter in the soil, and this in turn makes permafrost more vulnerable to thaw. And neither of these processes are incorporated into our current estimates. Um, I just wanna go back to this Paris Climate Agreement. Um, where the international community um, decided to hold, um, to make efforts to hold the increase in global average temperature to well below two degrees Celsius with efforts to limit it to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. Um, this question of can we stay below 1.5 degrees Celsius, I would say is very challenging given that um, the full permafrost carbon emissions were not included in global carbon budgets. Um, and we estimate that permafrost thaw will use up, say, about 25% of the allowable emissions to stay below 1.5 degrees Celsius, making it even more challenging. Um, and on my final slide, I just wanna end with this forest, which is not in the Arctic, but I wanna bring up the point that carbon di dioxide and methane are global greenhouse gases. This is why we're having this problem in the Arctic and why the changes that happen in the Arctic impact everyone on the planet. But it also points to the fact that as we protect forests, as we reduce fossil fuel emissions, we can also protect the carbon that's stored in permafrost. With that, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Sue. And uh, we will now turn to uh, Dr. Katie Anthony. Katie. Yeah, thank you also for everybody who's tuning in today. I am a researcher at the University of Alaska Fairbanks and have worked quite a bit in Russia, Siberia as well as other parts of the Pan-Arctic. And uh, my research focuses on thermokarst um, lake formation and greenhouse gas emissions. Current climate models do not include carbon emissions from thermokarst lakes. So today I'm going to be talking about the importance of abrupt permafrost thaw, such as thermokarst lake formation, in accelerating climate warming. So permafrost soils contain 1,500 gigatons of carbon, 
That's about 150 years worth of current fossil fuel emissions. And until now, permafrost carbon feedback models have only taken into account the process of gradual permafrost thaw. And under gradual permafrost thaw, the seasonal active layer is, is gradually getting deeper as permafrost thaws from the top down. And that makes soil organic carbon available to microbes that generate atmospheric methane and carbon dioxide, which cause more warming and more thaw. So the potential for old carbon release to the atmosphere as active layer deepens has been implied from laboratory incubations where scientists take permafrost soils and put them into vials in the lab and quantify how much methane and carbon dioxide are produced. <laughs> it's also implied from soil warming experiments. However, very few studies in unmanipulated terrestrial ecosystems have directly observed old carbon <laughs> emissions. And the reason for this, as Sue explained, is that as permafrost is thawing, not only is carbon being mobilized, but nutrients are released, which enhance the growth of plants. And as these plant, as plant productivity increases, they're soaking up carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And an intermodal comparison of permafrost carbon feedback models suggested that it's not going to be until the end of this century that, that permafrost region changes from a net carbon sink to a net carbon source. The problem with these land surface models, though, is that they're missing a really important process that we know accelerates permafrost carbon feedback, and that is abrupt thaw. In contrast to gradual thaw, whereby that seasonal active layer is getting deeper um, over by centimeters over time scales of decades, in abrupt thaw, when you get water ponding at the surface, the water is absorbing and storing heat, <clears throat> and it causes the ground to thaw really quickly, deeply. And so in a matter of decades, you can get tens of meters of permafrost thaw. <clears throat> and so for over 20 years, scientists have been reporting ancient greenhouse gases being released from thermal karst lakes. So the take home message today is that abrupt thaw, if we, if we include it in our models, it doubles the permafrost carbon feedback this century. Abrupt thaw is the most efficient means of releasing old permafrost carbon. Abrupt thaw accelerated when climate warmed 14,000 years ago. It's accelerating now, and it will continue to accelerate as climate warms in the future. About 20% of the permafrost region is ice-rich permafrost, which is susceptible to thermokarst. When ground ice melts, the ground surface collapses, and in place where you, places where the water can't drain away, the water actually pools at the surface. And so the soil that was previously frozen then becomes food for microbes that generate greenhouse gases. And Stanford Magazine depicted this process this way. In the anaerobic thaw bulbs beneath thermokarst lakes, this permafrost soil organic carbon is decomposed and generates carbon dioxide and methane, with methane escaping the lakes predominantly by ebullition or bubbling. And carbon dioxide, for the most part, escapes lakes by diffusion. In the summer, when methane bubbles rise up through the water column, they reach the lake surface and pop, releasing their, their methane to the atmosphere. But in the winter, lake ice forms at the surface, and so the bubbles rising up through the water column get trapped under the ice, the downward growing ice. And a field test we do on just about every new lake that we go to is to take an ice spear and poke into those bubbles and light a match because methane is a flammable natural gas. And if the gas that we're seeing bubbling is methane, then we should get this kind of a result. And when we look at across the Arctic and think that each lake contains thousands of these methane seeps and that there are millions of thermokarst lakes that are expanding and forming anew, draining, the ground refreezes and the lakes form again, we need to answer the question, how important is this abrupt thaw process in the permafrost carbon feedback? So one way that we quantify methane emissions from lakes is to go out on lakes with a shovel, remove the snow, and map the, the types and densities of methane bubbles trapped in lake ice. And then we use an ice spear to open the ice and install underwater bubble traps that record the bubbling rates from individual seeps year round. And we've employed these methods on more than 300 lakes in the Pan-Arctic across different permafrost zones and, and ecosystem types and climate regimes. <clears throat> 
And recently, we've even developed a method where we can directly see these ebullition bubbles in lake ice with satellite radar. So that's um, giving us a lot of new insights to help solve some of the discrepancies between bottom-up and top-down dis discrepancies in the global methane budget. And what we have found is that the amount of methane bubbling out of lakes is directly proportional to the amount of soil carbon that's entering the lakes by thermokarst erosion. We also see that the radiocarbon age of the methane in the bubbles is, has a one-to-one -one relationship with the soil permafrost carbon age. And so some soils are very old Pleistocene age and they're emitting Pleistocene age methane. But there are other places where the permafrost formed during the Holocene and it's younger. And as a result, the methane coming out of those lakes has that Holocene age <coughs> signal to it. And then other places we have a mixed signal where we have old and, old and young carbon mixing. This slide is showing that methane and carbon dioxide emissions from these abrupt thaw lakes are orders of magnitude higher than gradual thaw on the landscape. However, gra the, the gradual thaw environment is so large compared to abrupt thaw. Abrupt thaw are these patchy places where lakes are forming. We also see that the age of the methane coming out of abrupt thaw lakes and carbon dioxide is much older than that being released from gradual thaw. And that's because abrupt thaw can go meet many meters down below the surface where really old carbon is at and gradual thaw is just tapping into the top layers. So in order to answer the question, how important is abrupt thaw to the permafrost carbon feedback? We compared the radiative forcing associated with gradual thaw of land in brown to abrupt thaw from a frost um, carbon dioxide and methane emissions from thermocarst lakes shown in blue and for RCP 4.5 and 8.5. And what we found is that abrupt thaw doubles the permafrost carbon feedback this century. The impact is larger for RCP 4.5 and that's because a certain amount of warming, only a certain amount of warming is needed to form these lakes and that results in a large amount of methane release um, in contrast, that smaller amount of warming does not have as big of an impact on gradual thaw. And the other interesting thing to note is that methane becomes the dominant forcing factor of the permafrost carbon feedback this century when we take into account abrupt thaw. So 21st century permafrost carbon emissions are relatively small compared to global carbon dioxide emissions. However, they're similar in magnitude to land use change which is the second most, important, second most important anthropogenic source of greenhouse gases. They're also equivalent to about 10% of the allowable emissions if we want to curb climate warming to two degrees Celsius this century. The emissions I've presented so far did not account for other types of abrupt thaw. Here we're looking at a very large retrogressive thaw slump in Siberia. There are also places where permafrost dominated um, wetlands, the ground ice melts and they form what's called a collapse scar bog. I've also not included uh, the process of how older lakes that have been sitting around on the landscape for thousands of years soak up carbon dioxide because the terrestrial environment, as the lakes expand, the terrestrial carbon around the lakes falls into the lake bottoms. Um, it releases nutrients to the lakes, which stimulates plant growth in the lakes. The lakes have very little oxygen in their bottoms. And so there's little, little decomposition while they are lakes. And then when the lakes drain, all that carbon that was deposited in these old lakes refreezes. And so lakes are actually a net sink of carbon, of carbon today. And then I have also not talked about the importance of geologic methane escape from permafrost. So Merritt Turetsky recently led a permafrost carbon network effort to take into account some of these processes. And she looked at three different types of abrupt thaw, hill slope erosion, where we have retrogressive thaw slumps and thermoerosional gullies, thermocarst lakes formed in mineral sediments, and thermocarst lakes and, and wetlands formed in lowland organic sediments. And what she found is that once the successional pathway trajectories are taken into account, where these the new abrupt thaw features originally form and release a lot of carbon. And then over time, they mature and carbon starts to accumulate in some of them. That when all of those timescales of, of carbon loss and carbon uptake are accounted for, that each of these landscape types emits about one third of the total amount of carbon coming out of abrupt thaw. Hill slope erosion 
is dominated by carbon dioxide emission because the decomposition there happens in the presence of oxygen. In thermocarst lakes and wetlands, where we have water logging, waterlogged soils, methane dominates the emissions from these, from these environments. So altogether, abrupt thaw, by 2300, the cumulative emissions is around 80 gigatons of carbon. And that is about 40% of the emissions estimated to occur from gradual thaw models, except that these abrupt thaw environments are releasing 40% of the emissions, but they occupy less than 5% of the area. So that makes these abrupt thaw sites hotspots of permafrost carbon emissions. Or are they? Recently, the importance of the permafrost carbon feedback has been brought into question. Some new data sets have shown, looked at how the radiocarbon age of methane trapped in Antarctic glacial ice. And what they concluded in this study was that old carbon reservoirs, such as permafrost, were not important during the last deglaciation. When atmospheric temperatures rose four degrees Celsius, they did not see a large increase in old carbon. So they concluded that the four degree trajectory that we're, the Earth is on today for warming by 2100 also will not release old permafrost carbon. These conclusions were corroborated by some other recent papers that looked at the age of greenhouse gas emissions from thermocarst lakes and found that a lot of it's relatively young. So to explore this further, I compiled the paleo records of when thermocarst lakes formed during the Holocene, and they're shown here in the bottom panel, the gray histogram. And what we saw is that 14,000 years ago, when the climate started warming, permafrost abruptly thawed and thermocarst lakes flared up on the landscape. The ice core model allows for permafrost emissions on the order of 7 to 18 teragrams of methane per year. Our completely independent approach of estimating bottom-up emissions from thermocarst lakes results in less than 1 to 11 teragrams per year. So they're both consistent. But the conclusion I would draw from this is that when climate warms, permafrost thaws. It thaws abruptly by the formation of these lakes. It has in the past, and it will in the future. It's important to think that this, consider that this four degree warming happened over 8,000 years. The four degree warming projected to occur now is, is over 80 years, and that's a really big difference. So we are standing at the threshold of abrupt change in permafrost carbon emissions. This shows permafrost soil carbon emissions over time on a log scale. 10,000 years ago, he, the little wiggle is the amount that came out with that, that four degree warming then. And here on the right hand side, we're looking at hundreds of times more carbon coming out in response to permafrost climate warming that is a, to occur in the next 80 years. And then to explore the claim that thermocarst lakes emit young carbon and, and, not, and that old carbon is not important, I compiled from the relevant literature radiocarbon ages of methane and carbon dioxide being emitted from different types of thermocarst lakes. And what we see is that thermocarst lakes formed in Pleistocene age Yetima permafrost emit old carbon dioxide and methane. Lakes formed in non-Yetima permafrost soils, which are the types of permafrost that the permafrost actually formed during the Holocene, emit younger carbon. Ebullition was always older than diffusion. And that's because ebullition is, is providing a plumbing pathway for gas formed deep within these thaw bulbs, deep down where that old carbon is thawing, allowing those gas bubbles to escape. Whereas diffusion is releasing methane and carbon dioxide formed in surface lake sediments where the carbon is younger. Now, I think another important consideration when we think about future permafrost carbon feedbacks is how many new lakes can the landscape really support? We're looking at a photograph of the Northern Seward Peninsula, Alaska, and it's, you, could, you could fly into different parts of Siberia and see the same thing. Today, there are only islands, only remnants of intact permafrost that is ice rich that could allow the formation of new lakes. Much of the landscape has already been eaten up by thermocars throughout the Holocene. And so today, if a new lake were to form right in this island, this upland plateau, the lake could only expand, become so big before it would reach, tap into a drain basin or a river, and then the lake would drain. And so the, the role of drainage versus lake area growth is, is something that we need to constrain better. <laughs> 
And then the final thing I want to talk about is the importance of geologic methane. There's a, a huge amount of actual methane. Now we're not talking about organic carbon, but methane itself trapped in and beneath permafrost. And as permafrost thaws, you don't have to take away the entire column of permafrost to allow this gas to escape. Permafrost simply needs to become more permeable. And as groundwater is thawing permafrost from the bottom up and we're getting thermocarst lakes forming at the top, and we have places of permafrost that have um, high conductivity and are already thawed, we are seeing thousands of geologic methane, methane seeps, places where coal bed methane and thermogenic methane associated with oil um, basins is already escaping to the atmosphere. We don't know how old these geologic seeps are, how many of them have formed recently. Um, there's evidence that some of these blowouts in the Yamal Peninsula have, like we see in the middle picture, have formed recently. Um, we have recently discovered a very large methane seep in a lake in northwest Alaska. This lake is emitting 11 tons of methane per day. That's enough energy to fuel 800 households. The problem is there are not 800 households nearby. There isn't even one. So... It's, it's of interest, but definitely highly unconstrained how much geologic methane is coming out of the Arctic today and how that might increase in the future as permafrost becomes more permeable. And with that, I will um, show my conclusions again and thank you for listening. I'd also like to thank the many researchers that have contributed to this work, as well as the National Science Foundation and NASA for supporting it. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Katie. Um, and um, let me now remind those who might have come in late that our scheduled third panelist, Dr. Michael Sfrega, uh, who is the head of the Polar Institute at the Woodrow Wilson Center, uh, has uh, at the last minute been unable to join us because of the very serious illness of his father. Uh, and uh, we all wish Mike and his father uh, the best in this difficult time. Uh, I'm going to talk briefly uh, in his place about uh, the issues that were uh, on his plate uh, for this panel presentation. Uh, he was going to talk about uh, addressing the regional terrestrial impacts of permafrost thaw, uh, understanding the global impacts of the higher permafrost emission scenarios, uh, and how the global science and policy communities are addressing those challenges. So let me say a few words uh, about each. Uh, first, the regional uh, and terrestrial impacts from ice melt. Uh, it's already been mentioned uh, that a big set of those impacts is uh, thawing, uh, leading to subsidence of uh, the ground. And that has uh, direct impacts on buildings, the, the cracking and undermining of buildings, uh, direct impacts on infrastructure, uh, pipelines, for example, roads, uh, for example. Uh, and um, in addition, the thawing uh, of permafrost has impacts on river erosion and coastal erosion, which in turn uh, impact uh, a number of important human values, uh, including the viability of uh, indigenous settlements uh, along the coasts, uh, and including the rate of erosion around uh, the rivers. Uh, when you ask what is being done about this, uh, there's a considerable amount of scientific and engineering talent uh, trying to figure out how, for example, to modify and reinforce existing structures. Uh, to make them uh, more resistant to damage by uh, subsidence. Uh, there is a fair amount of effort going into how you design uh, new structures, new buildings, uh, pipelines, roads, in ways that make them uh, less vulnerable uh, to permafrost thaw. Uh, but these are really difficult challenges. Uh, there have been uh, attempts even to figure out how to refrigerate permafrost locally so that it doesn't thaw and subside uh, under buildings in particular. Uh, and that can succeed on a very local basis, but it's extremely energy intensive and it's very limited in the extent that can be dealt with. Uh, when you look at the uh, effects of uh, permafrost thaw in contributing 
to uh, the multifaceted problem of the decreasing viability of coastal villages, uh, which comes from the loss of sea ice, which exposes them to increased wave action uh, uh, from powerful storms, sea level rise, uh, and the effect of thawing permafrost. Uh, in the end, the principal remedy uh, for those problems uh, is probably relocation. And yet relocation, moving those uh, coastal settlements to uh, more sustainable locations is extremely expensive. During the Obama administration, when I was the science advisor to President Obama, and we were struggling with uh, how these problems might be dealt with, uh, we made an estimate that moving a particular village that was imperiled by the combination of these phenomena, permafrost loss, sea ice loss, sea level rise, a village of 400 people, uh, moving it to a safer location would cost $400 million, a million dollars a person. Uh, obviously, there are capable people trying to figure out how that could be done uh, less expensively, uh, but nobody has any idea where money of that magnitude uh, would come from uh, for these uh, many villages that are now threatened to be, uh, to be relocated. Um, that underlines the point that the uh, real solution in the long run uh, will have to be abatement of global emissions that are driving the global warming problem and the problem of particularly rapid warming uh, in the Arctic. Uh, but that's a very long-term effort. I'll say a little more about that in a moment. Uh, but uh, we're going to need a lot more work in the meantime on how to adapt uh, effectively, practically, and affordably to the impacts of climate change in the Arctic that we're no longer able to avoid, impacts that are occurring already and that will certainly uh, continue to grow for some time to come, uh, simply because uh, we have no way to stop the rise of global greenhouse gases overnight. Uh, and even after the rise uh, of those gases uh, has stopped and begun to be reduced, uh, aspects of the problem will soldier on uh, over not only many decades, but uh, many hundreds of years. And in the case of sea level rise, probably over a millennia. Uh, sea level rise is not promptly reversible, uh, even if we could promptly reverse the additions of greenhouse gases globally uh, to the atmosphere. Uh, when it comes to understanding the global impact of higher permafrost uh, emission scenarios, uh, and we've seen a number of them now from our two previous speakers, uh, the very important point, which I think each of our speakers made very well, but I will make again, is that there is still a lot of uncertainty about the exact rate at which carbon will come out uh, of warming and thawing permafrost. There is uncertainty about the fraction of it that will be methane versus the fraction that will be CO2. Uh, work of the sort uh, that Dr. Anthony and Dr. Natale talked about uh, is contributing to narrowing those uncertainties, but uh, there's still a lot more uh, work that needs to be done before we can be confident that we know what the amounts uh, will be uh, over the decades immediately ahead and over the century. Indeed, part of that uncertainty is something that we won't uh, be confident about until it materializes, and that is the dependence on the rate of temperature rise going forward, which in turn depends on the rate of global greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and while we'd love to be able to predict that and predict a low level of global emissions, a declining level uh, over the rest of this century, uh, it is impossible to be uh, certain about that. If you look at the quantitative magnitude of the differences reported in the literature on how much carbon uh, will be released uh, from warming and thawing permafrost over this century, uh, there really is a very large range of values. Uh, I think uh, the more recent values, which are the kinds uh, reported uh, by doctors Natalie and Anthony, uh, numbers in the range of uh, 80 to uh, 100 or more uh, gigatons over the remainder of this century uh, seem to be better uh, founded uh, 
than the lower estimates that sometimes appear in the literature. I'm very concerned that uh, the upper estimates, the higher estimates are likely to be the correct ones. Uh, and if they are, the implication is that they will take a very substantial bite out of the so-called carbon budget that is available for all of the other greenhouse gas producing activities that civilization engages in, the fossil fuel burning, uh, the uh, carbon emitting agriculture, uh, agricultural practices, uh, the carbon emitting deforestation. That carbon budget is defined as the amount of carbon that we can afford to add to the atmosphere without exceeding our goal. And the globally accepted goal at this point is to confine the global average surface temperature increase to uh, two degrees Celsius with the aspirational goal that has been mentioned of trying to keep it to one and a half. And it has to be noted that the increase to date is now at around 1.1 or 1.2 degrees Celsius. So we're already very close indeed to the 1.5 target. And it will be extremely challenging to avoid uh, going to two degrees Celsius and beyond. And again, the key point about these Arctic emissions is uh, that they could represent uh, a currently uncounted uh, factor in the global carbon budget uh, that amounts to uh, 25%, 30%, 40%, depending on the exact value of the total carbon budget. It means that we would be much more tightly constrained in all the other human carbon emitting activities than we would have been had these emissions from the rapidly warming Arctic uh, not taken place. Uh, let me turn finally to a few words about how the global science and policy communities are uh, addressing this set of challenges emanating uh, from the Arctic. Uh, obviously, it is uh, relevant to mention uh, what's going on worldwide, but I think most of the watchers of this breakout session will be aware of what has happened, uh, for example, in uh, the Paris Agreement that emerged from the Conference of the Parties to the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change in Paris in December of 2015, where 195 countries agreed to specific uh, targets for reducing their emissions from what they would otherwise be in the period out to 2025 or 2030. Uh, the bad news there is that very few countries are actually on target to meet those commitments, and those commitments themselves would only be a down payment on the much deeper reductions uh, that would be required uh, out to 2050 and out to 2100. Um, the, uh, of course, a uh, very important point there is that United States leadership in this global effort to reduce all greenhouse gas emissions has been greatly weakened under the current administration uh, because uh, the current administration uh, is uh, withdrawing from the Paris Agreement, President Trump announced in uh, June of 2017 that the United States intended to withdraw, and he halted uh, most of the activities that the United States government was engaged in with the aim of meeting its commitments under the, under the Paris goals. Uh, that's a serious setback uh, for uh, the global effort. Obviously, no other countries uh, have withdrawn up until now, but uh, some are surely uh, considering it, and that would be a further uh, setback to the possibility of meeting our global targets. Uh, in terms of uh, specific actions related to the Arctic, it's uh, important to mention, I think, uh, the efforts of the Arctic Council. The Arctic Council was established in 1996 uh, to promote cooperation and coordination among the eight Arctic nations, uh, which I identified at the beginning uh, of these remarks. Uh, also, uh, strong involvement in the Arctic Council of Indigenous Communities. There are uh, uh, six uh, Indigenous peoples organizations from the Arctic that uh, participate in the work of the Arctic Council. There are more than 20 uh, observer states and organizations, uh, countries that do not have Arctic territory but have an interest in what happens in the Arctic, participate in the work of the Arctic Council. The work of the Arctic Council – 
is very heavily focused on sustainable development, on environmental protection, uh, on shipping, and on scientific research in the Arctic. It doesn't focus on the defense uh, and international relations dimensions of uh, Arctic issues directly. But it has uh, produced a number of important agreements, uh, including uh, an agreement on cooperation on Arctic monitoring and research. Uh, and uh, that has been reflected on an even broader canvas by uh, a set of meetings of the world's science ministers, uh, not just the science ministers of the Arctic nations, but science ministers from about 25 nations who have interests in the Arctic. Uh, I convened the first such meeting of global science ministers in the White House in September of 2016. Uh, it was uh, very successful in fostering expanded collaboration among nations on Arctic monitoring measurement uh, and analysis to better understand the pace uh, of the uh, impacts that we've been talking about here, including particularly the uh, pace in the uh, emissions of carbon dioxide and methane. Uh, a second such meeting was held in October of 2018 in Berlin, was sponsored uh, and hosted by uh, the German government, the European Union, and the government of Finland. And there is another, uh, was another scheduled uh, for the fall of this year in Japan, it is most likely uh, to be postponed. But the fact is that the world scientific community and the uh, political dimension of scientific activity is reflected in the world's governments. Uh, all of this is being ramped up uh, in light of the challenges we face in the Arctic. There is uh, such a lot more to do. And again, a last key point uh, before we turn to a bit of interaction among the panelists and then interaction with the audience is that when you think about the overall response that is needed to the challenges of global climate change, you need to understand that we have only three options as a global civilization. Now, the first option is what specialists refer to as climate change mitigation. That means reducing uh, the pace and the magnitude of the changes that are occurring as a result of our activities by reducing our emissions or by uh, enhancing the sinks that take greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere. <clears throat> the second option is adaptation measures you take to reduce the actual damage that occurs from the climatic changes and impacts that you can no longer avoid. And the third option is suffering. And everybody really needs to understand that if we want to minimize the suffering, which of course should be the aim uh, of everybody, we need to maximize both uh, mitigation, uh, emissions reductions, and uh, we need to maximize adaptation. But when you think about the Arctic, the Arctic's contribution to emissions from direct activities such as uh, fossil fuel burning uh, or agriculture are very, very small as a fraction of what's going on globally. What we most need in the Arctic and what we need immediately is much more progress on adaptation, on figuring out how to reduce the damages from the changes in climate that are ongoing. Well, let me uh, now, with that observation, uh, open it up uh, briefly before we open it up to the whole uh, to the whole floor uh, to the to the other panelists and see if there are questions that they would like to address to each other uh, or uh, or additional comments uh, that they would like to make. Uh, let me start with Sue Natali. Sure, thanks, John. I guess I'll ask. Uh, Questions for both of you. I guess I'll start with you. My um, first question is just about um, adaptation and relocation in the Arctic, and particularly 
focus on the U.S. Um, and so my understanding is that it's not just an issue of money, but it's also an issue of that we currently don't have a governance framework to deal with this. And I know that you initiated um, and started a lot of this work um, in the Obama White House. Um, but right now, it seems like there's no agency like FEMA to deal with impacts of permafrost thaw. So what do you think we need to do? And how likely do you think that this could happen? And, and you know, this is an issue that's not just Arctic related because climate change, adaptation, relocation is going to be impacting other areas as well and has been. OK, well, thank you, Sue, for that question. <clears throat> in the Obama administration, uh, in the last two years, we had something called the Arctic Executive Steering Committee, uh, which the president asked me to chair, uh, which had the heads or deputy heads of all of the 25 cabinet departments, agencies, and offices with Arctic responsibilities. And the Arctic Executive Steering Committee was responsible for promoting coordination, cooperation, communication among those 25 departments, agencies, and offices, and also in building new initiatives to deal with the specific problems facing the Arctic. And we were on a pretty good trajectory. Uh, we got a lot done in the two years, including uh, organizing uh, the first ever uh, conference of uh, foreign ministers from all around the world, foreign ministers, not science ministers, in Anchorage focused on climate change in the Arctic. And we had a number of initiatives focused on supporting adaptation uh, in the Arctic uh, in a variety of forms. Unfortunately, as far as I know, there has been no continuation of that effort in the current administration. Uh, we still do have uh, an Arctic uh, Research Commission, a U.S. Arctic Research Commission that is chaired uh, by Fran Ulmer, a very distinguished Arctic expert who was formerly the Lieutenant Governor of Alaska, formerly the Chancellor of the University of Alaska in Anchorage. Uh, we still have an interagency Arctic Research Policy Committee, uh, which works closely with the Arctic Research Commission to figure out exactly what U.S. agencies need to be doing. But you are right that we are currently lacking an adequate overarching framework. Uh, globally, the principal overarching framework that is established uh, in law and international relations is the uh, is the Eight Nation Arctic Council. It is increasingly focused on this. Uh, the third thing that is happening that's very important is that the number of initiatives involving uh, civil society organizations, uh, the academies of science and engineering, organizations like the Woodsell Research Center, the Woodrow Wilson Center, uh, academic uh, entities like the University of Alaska Fairbanks and counterparts around the world, all of these groups are increasingly collaborating, increasingly communicating. Uh, more and more networks have emerged of folks working on questions like permafrost law, working on questions like adaptation in the Arctic. Uh, but we would benefit greatly uh, if we could strengthen the framework, as your question suggests. Thank you. Katie? Questions, comments, or cries of outrage? Yeah, I've got questions also for both of you, but maybe I'll start with you, John. Um, what is, which is more expensive in terms of costs associated with permafrost thaw? Dealing with local infrastructure problems or the more global expense of the carbon emission ramification? Well, I think... Uh, it's a challenging question. The first part of the answer, I suppose, is that nobody knows exactly. Uh, all estimates of the costs of these measures are preliminary and tentative. Uh, the most interesting recent results uh, that I have seen uh, looking at the global costs of, uh, of meeting a two degree C target uh, in terms of emissions reductions and carbon management are quite encouraging. Uh, they indicate that uh, with uh, political will and organization, uh, the world could probably do this uh, with an impact of less than uh, 3% on global GDP, uh, which uh, is, in light of the stakes, rather modest, since the impacts of unabated climate change are likely to far exceed 3%. 
a, a, a hit of 3% on global GDP. And because this effort has to be so large, because the activities that are responsible for the emissions, uh, above all, energy production using fossil fuels, and the world, by the way, is still 80% dependent on coal, oil, and natural gas being burned in ways that release all of the contained carbon to the atmosphere. Uh, that's a big system. It's a big problem. It's going to take a long time and, and a lot of money uh, to fix. And the uh, next biggest uh, sources are agriculture and forestry. And those two are substantial parts uh, of the global economy. And the forces that drive the current uh, arrangements in those sectors are very deeply embedded in our economies, in our cultures. So all of this is not going to be easy to change. In a sense, the uh, local and regional aspects of Arctic problems uh, should be uh, easier and less expensive to manage, but the uh, infrastructure and the management structure for doing so, uh, just as uh, as Sue Natali's question about uh, responses uh, uh, on the science uh, in the Arctic uh, are suffering from an inadequate overall architecture. We are certainly suffering from an adequate overall architecture for dealing uh, with the regional responses uh, in the Arctic. And uh, we have to rely on the, uh, the values and the commitment of the people who are governing these Arctic regions, and those vary rather uh, dramatically. Uh, nonetheless, I am encouraged by the increasing amount of communication, collaboration, and cooperation that is occurring across Arctic nations. Uh, both you uh, and Sue have mentioned uh, collaborations with Russian scientists. Uh, that's been happening for a long time. I think it's going to grow. Uh, we have uh, collaborations uh, that are underway in all of our organizations with Canadian scientists, with uh, scientists and policymakers in Iceland and Greenland and Finland and Russia uh, and uh, on these issues. And uh, I'm putting a lot of hope in those uh, collaborative efforts uh, growing and ultimately uh, being reinforced by a stronger overarching framework for managing the whole thing. You had another question, you had a question for Sue? Yeah, my question for Sue. Sue, in the winter, these high carbon dioxide emissions that you were reporting, I was wondering what the mechanism is. I, I think of winter time, the soils are frozen. Um, so are there unfrozen soil, are there unfrozen soils due to salinity that are remaining unfrozen? And then what allows the actual gas to migrate through what frozen icy soils? So um there's a couple things. So there could, there could be frozen pockets, right? So the surface may freeze and then you have these deeper soil layers that ha haven't frozen yet. So that's one possibility. Um, the other thing that happens is that um, unfrozen, a film of unfrozen water can be retained around a soil particle, even when the temperatures are quite low. Um, and how much of that water remains unfrozen depends on soil particle size. So you tend to get less unfrozen water in sand and more in smaller particle size soils. And so there's sort of physical mechanisms that allow microbes to be active and to access, um, which is also really important, access substrate. So there's dissolved carbon in these fil water films essentially around the soil particles. Um, if there's a block of, un of ice that's very thick and without cracks in it, then that gas often will get trapped. And so you, it's not uncommon to see a burst of, of CO2 and also methane coming out when, you're, when the um, spring, um, when things start to thaw in the springtime. Okay, so can I just follow up? So it sounds like the unfrozen water content is related to soil texture, and that might be yeah. slightly more homogenous. Nothing is, but it might be compared. It, but the pathway for escape might be heterogeneous depending on blockages. And so do you, see, when you put your chambers down, do you see that it's very patchy? You get high emissions maybe where there's a crack and then where there's blocked emissions. Yeah. I mean, it's the challenge of the winter measurements. I mean, it's one of the reasons 
I think why, I mean, there's many reasons why we have so few measurements in the winter, but this is one of the challenges that you do get this patchiness. I mean, in some ways it's like ebullition, right? You can, if you just go to one spot and then go home, you may miss something important or you may hit a hot spot and come up with something that's not realistic. And so, you know, you try to measure in many places or using instrumentation like eddy covariance. So there's, there's ways to get at it, but it is definitely, um, definitely a challenge to get at a good, reliable number. Okay, we have about 15 minutes left, and I want to turn to some questions that have been submitted uh, by people uh, on the web who have been watching this presentation. Uh, the first one is a question for Sue Natali. Can you please say a few words about mountain permafrost, a form of sporadic permafrost, which is located across the globe at nearly all latitudes, and the contributions of that permafrost? to CO2 and methane emissions in comparison to the Arctic. Katie, you could jump in if you want to help. I So most, the, the Arctic has very carbon uh, rich soils I and mean, not all the soils in the Arctic are carbon rich, um, but much of the, uh, the, when we think about um, carbon feedbacks, um, we do tend to focus on the Arctic. It is not the only permafrost. There is Arctic and other high latitude regions. Um, some of the other concerns about permafrost thaw in these other, in the mountain regions, um, don't necessarily have to do just with carbon. I mean, mountain regions tend to have lower carbon carbon contents, um, but also permafrost controls hydrology. And so in some of these high latitude areas outside of the Arctic, the important sort of mechanism of change or pathway of change is through, um, you know, thawing of permafrost leading to, to drying or changes in hydrology overall. So I, um, I don't have a, an absolute number. And Katie, maybe if you want to chime in if you know about the carbon emissions from other permafrost regions? Well, the Tibetan Plateau is a place where there's interesting permafrost carbon emissions. Um, the pool size of the carbon there is, is smaller than what it is in, in the Arctic. Again, the, a lot of the Arctic is, um, is a continental climate and would actually be characterized as a desert, but because of this permafrost being so um, not draining well and water pools at the surface and freezes, you have these wetland environments that accumulate carbon and then, and then freeze it and form permafrost. So in a mountain region, drainage, drainage is so strong that it's often not a peat forming environment. And as Sue originally defined permafrost is it can be bedrock that's frozen for at least two consecutive years. So I don't know a lot about the, the mountain permafrost carbon stocks, but based on those environmental factors, I would, imagine that they're just a lot lower compared. Most of the permafrost carbon is in the Arctic, but certainly if there are some upland peatlands that could thaw in the mountains, that would be vulnerable also to emitting, emitting carbon. Thank you. Uh, Katie, I now have a, a, a quite complicated question for you from somebody who obviously uh, is very knowledgeable. And the question is as follows. Uh, in contrast, wait a minute. Okay, where, where did it go? <laughs> it, it just fled from my screen. Okay, here it is. In contrast to the situation today, Pleistocene deglaciations and warming were driven mainly by orbital changes that caused higher levels of summertime solar while the carbon dioxide concentration was in the 200 to 300 part per million range, which is low enough to allow strong winter cooling so permafrost thawing would only be in the near surface layer. Today, with the CO2 level over 400 parts per million and headed up, along with higher concentrations of methane, wintertime refreezing of the permafrost is not nearly as strong as during previous interglacials. And so the surface heating can penetrate deep into the permafrost, weakening and thawing it. Thus, it seems that using paleo deglaciations as analogs for the present may lead to serious underestimates, and this needs to be recognized. What are your thoughts on this? Might the near future risk of a tipping point thus be much higher than in the past? And might this different mechanism of forcing also apply to the ice sheets and make the likelihood of rapid melting of the ice sheets be even greater than paleo analogs show? How's that for a question? <laughs> it's a good one. <laughs> all right, hopefully I'll be able to answer all of it. Um, I think it's really fantastic and important to look at the paleo record. Um, what, what, 
If we go through glacial and interglacial cycles that are driven by changes in, in orbital patterns, then what we tend to see is that during glaciations, permafrost sequesters carbon. And then during deglacial periods, that permafrost thaws. And so, yes, we have unprecedented warming now, but if we look back through time, it, we would have also had permafrost form and disappear. And I think a very interesting thing is that we can look back at the per age of permafrost and there is permafrost that has survived uh, previous interglacial periods, even ones that have been warmer than now. So not all permafrost will thaw and some of it gets preserved. But I think the fact that we have seen permafrost come and go during these glacial interglacial periods is important. Um, the Dansgaard Oscar events that occurred in the late Pleistocene, there were these spikes of atmospheric carbon dioxide and methane that could have been due to this just localized surface permafrost thaw. And so, yeah, that what happens in the winter in terms of being able to refreeze or, or actually cool the ground is very important. Um, the rate of climate, the rate of warming though in the next 80 years is I think very different than what happened during the last deglaciation where that warming happened over 88,000 years. And so, um, there's a lot of, we try to model this, but definitely there are a lot of unpredictable variables. Okay. I have another question for you, Katie. Uh, this one's okay. shorter, uh, but still, uh, I think challenging. Is there potential for mitigation of methane emissions from Thermokarst Lake by anaerobic methane oxidation by ANME archaea, as in marine sediments? <sighs> Yes, these ANME2D microbes, they are microbes that, archaea, that consume methane under anaerobic conditions. Uh, and we have been finding that they are pretty common in thermokarst lakes. However, in our budget, it doesn't appear that they are consuming a very large fraction of the amount of methane that's produced. Um, we need to study more lakes to, to see if that's wrong. But yes, these anaerobic methane oxidizers are there and yet we see huge emissions. So they're not doing the full job. I think something that um, needs more attention is aerobic methanotrophy. There is, unfortunately, a lot of the methane escapes lakes is by bubbles and those bubbles escape so quickly as they come up through the water column that they're bypassing oxidation. But in the winter, when they get trapped by the ice, the methane actually leaves the bubble and goes into the water column and dissolves. And so then that bubble methane is available to microbes, either anaerobic ones or aerobic ones that could decompose or could oxidize the methane. What happens though, is that as the winters are getting warmer, the ice sheet gets thinner and the period of frozen is shorter. And so that oxidation capacity is, is disappearing and that's gonna actually cause the problem to get worse. Less methane will get oxidized and more will go into the atmosphere. Thank you. Another question for Sue Natali. How much is known about oceanic permafrost? I'm assuming there would be more anaerobic methane production there, but I don't hear people talk about it very much. Yeah, I actually think Katie could probably um, hit on this a little bit more, but I mean, you know, one of the things about methane production is, is you know, methane has to be produced and then it has to make it out to the atmosphere before it gets oxidized. So um, if you're having methane produced um, in the ocean, if it's not making it up to the atmosphere, if it's being oxidized to CO2, um, then it's it's not this Im as Im important new source into the atmosphere. So um, what, what the contributions are from methane from uh, permafrost deposits in the ocean. Um, I don't know, Katie, if you want to comment on the magnitude of those, but my feeling is, is that it's, we're not seeing this big pulse. Um, it's from these thermokarst lakes, which is really the concern here when we're thinking about methane emissions from the Arctic. Yeah. So during the last, during the last ice age, sea level was a lot lower. And so permafrost and even these thermokarst lake forming environments extended a lot farther out into what's now the Arctic Ocean. In the continental shelves. So as sea level rose during the last deglaciation, it covered up terrestrial permafrost. And some of that terrestrial permafrost is preserved today in the marine environment. Um, and it is emitting methane. The East Siberian Sea, the Laptev Sea region, is a place where we've seen really huge numbers. Um, there have been recent 
work that has brought those numbers down, but there are still hot spots of emission. Um, we think a lot of it is just the same thing, microbial decomposition of permafrost organic carbon. But certainly there are methane hydrates um, trapped in marine settings that could be in local places emitting methane. A lot of times that's under deep water environments though. And so as Sue said, if you're having geologic methane escaping from a deep water environment, a lot of it will dissolve in the water column and be oxidized before it escapes. So subsea permafrost is a source of methane um, and it's, it's part of the budget that needs to be considered. Good, thank you. Uh, th there is a last question directed to me, and it will enable me to offer part of an early uh, answer, part of an earlier question as well. The question is: Given how flat the Arctic appears and how little is above sea level, is adaptation really an option in the region? Uh, might what happened during the Eemian, the interglacial peaking around twelve thousand five hundred years ago, when global sea level was four to eight meters higher than at present, give some indication of the potential? for adaptation to sea level rise? Uh, the answer is a yes. Uh, from a variety of uh, paleoclimatological considerations, it has been concluded that the long-term commitment to sea level rise is probably in the range of two meters per degree C. Uh, and that means that if we were to uh, stop even at two degrees C, uh, we would see ultimately four meters of sea level rise. Uh, if we went to four degrees C, uh, we would uh, ultimately see uh, eight meters of sea level rise. Uh, what is completely uncertain is how fast these rises could materialize. Uh, the best estimates I have seen is uh, suggest that under high rates of uh, continuing emissions, <clears throat> we could see... Um, half a meter or more of sea level rise globally by 2050, uh, and as much as one to two meters by 2100. Um, but nobody knows for sure. Those kinds of numbers tell us that short-term adaptation measures to cope with a couple of feet of sea level rise are not going to suffice in the longer term, but we just don't know how much longer. Uh, let me uh, close by thanking uh, our panelists. Um, uh, terrific presentations. Uh, I learned a lot. Thank you both. Uh, thanks to the audience. And let me say very quickly to those watching, uh, if you want more information, both about the permafrost uh, issues and the non-permafrost impacts of rapid warming in the Arctic, I would direct you to the websites at the uh, Arctic Initiative at the Harvard Kennedy School, the Polar Initiative at the Woodrow Wilson Center, uh, the Arctic Research at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, Banks, the Arctic Project at the Woods Hole Research Center. You can find all those just by Googling them. Uh, and the annual Arctic Report of NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, as a start for deeper dives uh, should you want to do them. Uh, I apologize to those whose uh, questions uh, uh, could not be fit in. Uh, we are obliged to stop at one o'clock sharp because there is another uh, session following and the, and the uh, web connections are needed uh, for that from the Academy. So again, uh, thank you, uh, Sue. Thank you, Katie. Uh, Mike Sfrega, we wish you could have been with us, but we wish you all the best uh, in uh, in, in dealing uh, with your father's illness. Uh, thanks again to everybody in the audience and uh, good night, good afternoon, good morning, as the case may be.